is a letter that really summarizes the whole gospel. Uh, and the last few verses I wanted to save to the end. I didn't want to finish off last week with this because this is a summary of the summary. And it's the thesis statement of the letter. And so in your bulletin, we have a title, Faithfully Stand, Chosen in Christ. And if you look at 12, 13, and 14, um, you have this, as you look through it, I love how the Spirit translates scriptures for us. And in English, and I have an English standard version, and I could look down and it's almost right in the middle, uh, faithfully stand, um, I have stand firm, Bradley read stand fast, uh, but stand firm, uh, but faithfully stand, chosen in verse 13, and then the last is in Christ, and that's kind of the, the summary of the summary, okay, faithfully, we, we sang songs this morning, say worship the king, and I come to the garden alone, always think of Betty, Alice, uh, we come to the garden alone, one of her favorite songs, and stepping in the light, uh, stepping in the light that we're to be uh, the mouthpiece for Jesus, uh, sharing the light, and praise him, praise him. Peter ends this first letter by saying in verse 12, and so, Linda, really simple notes today. It's 12, 13, and 14, and the title is it, okay? It's the, the three things are faithfully stand, um, and then <clears throat> chosen is in verse 13, and then in Christ in verse 14. I'm going to try. This is a challenge for me. Um, <clears throat> my teachers always struggle with me on this one. I'm going to try and stay in the letter. Not going to wander today. I, I, we, we did a lot of verses last week um, looking at examples in other places. I'm going to try and stay because this is the summary of the summary. <clears throat> By Silvanus, or Silas, depending on how you translate that, um, Peter says in verse 12, By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him. Um, again, the letter Peter is writing is personal. It's personal. It has a purpose. <clears throat> and if you understand, um, basically this is, this is how, you know, documents were written. Um, the Jews had a, always had an oral tradition. We've been saying as we're going through our study in Acts on Sunday morning, we've been, uh, I've been talking about how the, Exodus that Jesus led um, was executed by the power of his Holy Spirit. He, he told his apostles that uh, in John 17, he prayed for them, and he says, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. He's going to remind you. Uh, it's actually John 14 through 17, and those, those chapters, uh, Jesus is addressing his apostles. <clears throat> and he says, uh, sanctify them by thy word, thy word is truth, Jesus' word is truth. But he says, I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit, and this helper is going to remind you of all that I've already taught you. And so, <clears throat> um, the faith that Jude says, once delivered, okay, contend for earnestly. Uh, this faith, uh, to be a faith, what does it mean to be a faithful brother? Uh, we started out this letter, Peter, this is the same Peter who preached uh, in Acts chapter 2, Irene, right? The, the starting of the church, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches. And when he preaches to those who were fully aware of the events of Jesus, this was Jesus' third year in his ministry, um, they come to the Passover and they, they basically glorify him, singing hosannas uh, to him at the beginning of the festival. And then it turns ugly, and Jesus is put on trial, and he's crucified. And it's it, it, it dark, 
it's somber, uh, it's probably the largest gathering uh, maybe in all their lifetimes in Jerusalem. And this miracle worker, which nobody denied, everyone was healed. People came from everywhere. Every year, you can imagine in Jesus' three-year uh, ministry, every year the Passover would have gotten a bigger and bigger draw. Can you imagine? Everybody chit-chatting, everybody talking about this miracle worker. Who wouldn't want to come and see this? And then what we call this a spectacle. What a spectacle. What a, what a, a, a roller coaster of emotions. And so Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, and when the crowd was cut to the heart, they said, well, what, what must we do? We crucified the Son of God. Everybody knows he's the Son of God. Everybody knows. Nobody could do what you do unless God is with them. Now what? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, very significant. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then, as we're going through Acts in our study, we see as the church begins. 3,000 souls are added that day. And then they go out and they're preaching this good news. And what's the good news? This Jesus, whom was crucified, rose from the dead, and all these people are witnesses of it. So if you had any doubt before because of who this miracle worker is, this miracle worker, after his crucifixion, after he was pronounced dead, after he was put in the grave, on the third day, he rose again, and he was with them, Alice, for a period of about 40 days, during those 40 days, uh, in his resurrected state, teaching them, speaking about the kingdom of God. And this same Peter now says, here's the gospel. The gospel is, this Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. That's why he's Jesus Christ. He's not Jesus, son of Joseph. And so Peter, at the beginning of this letter, he said, He's an apostle. That means he was a witness. He was with Jesus from the time of his baptism. Peter was with him before that, but by the time of his baptism, from his ministry to the time of his ascension. Um, we know that from Acts chapter 1 when they had to replace Judas who betrayed him. Uh, and they said, these are the qualifications to be an apostle. All right, And then they replaced Judas. But Peter says, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not Jesus, son of Joseph, not Jesus, son of Mary, Jesus Christ, the son of God. To those who are elect exiles in the dispersion, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. The sanctification of the Spirit. Jesus said, sanctify them by my word. My word is truth. Peter says, in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit came over them and allowed them to recall all that happened, all that went on, in the way the Holy Spirit wanted it delivered. Here's the purpose. For obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Now, in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. How many times in this letter does Peter say, born again? Not of perishable things, but imperishable things. What is uh, the seed of the kingdom, the word of God. Peter reiterates this over and over in his first letter as he's summarizing um, this time that Peter is um, communicating this and Sylvanus is writing it down. Peter's saying, I want to bring to your remember, I, I'm, I'm 
leaving soon. He's likely in Rome. And we'll see in verse 13. But he's likely in Rome, and he says, I'm, I, I need to write this down. I need to stir you up, he'll say in his next letter, but by way of reminder. I'm reminding you of what you already know, but it's of first importance. And that first importance is, you need to get in the kingdom. And there's only one way, and there's only one name. And so, that's at the outset. The question is, and Alan prayed this in the prayer, be faithful. The question is, here is faithful, my faithful brother, Sylvanus, who's writing this down for me. He's a faithful brother. It's interesting, in Peter's next letter, he's going to address those in the very first verse he's going to say to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours that's so significant because Christianity is not a theocracy it's not going to be set up like the Sanhedrin it's not going to be a Levitical tribe uh, of priests Peter says those who are in Christ are being built up as living stones and you're going to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You, Christians, who bear the name of Christ, okay? So what does it mean to be faithful when he says this faithful brother? I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring this is the true grace of God. This is 1 Peter 5, 12 again. And he says, stand firm in it. Stand firm in it. To be faithful is to stand firm. Last week we said uh, the power to stand. How do we even have the power to stand in a world that hates you? The world and everything in it hates you. How do you stand firm? How is it possible for you to withstand the suffering that Peter is about to go through and he's talking about? Peter's about to be executed in Rome. His life is coming to an end. And he's saying, stand firm, because the day of the Lord is coming. The, the day of the Lord, if we go through the Old Testament, especially in the minor prophets, is the judgment of God. Jer Jerusalem in 70 AD is about to be destroyed. And it's going to set off another persecution that's going to be so severe. The book of Revelation had to be written as a book of hope to the believers that they would understand this is Satan using Babylon. Babylon was the world superpower. That's what Babylon means. And at this time, Babylon is Rome. Satan's going to use the full power of Rome to destroy the church, Jesus and his church. Peter and John are going to say, stand firm over and over. In Peter's letter, it's all the way through, but here's the context. How do I stand faithfully? Because Jesus rose. We talked this morning, the Ethiopian eunuch out of Acts chapter 8, and we said that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading a passage. He's leaving Jerusalem, and he's reading a passage. He's in his chariot. He's reading Isaiah 53. And for brothers and sisters here, we always remember Rich Blakelock reading Isaiah 53 from the table, right, Mary? <laughs> you read the whole thing, right? We know Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant. And, and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah chapter 53, and the Spirit tells, the angel of the Lord tells uh, uh, Philip, go join yourself with this charity. He hears him reading from Isaiah the prophet, and uh, he says, do you understand? And the Ethiopian says, how can I unless somebody explain? Is he talking about himself or someone else? He just came from Jerusalem to worship the king. Gordon started with that song this morning, and it's just everything kind of fits together. I, I can't tell you the joy I have in coming here, uh, the blessing of this, to worship the king. So... From that passage, Philip preaches to the Ethiopian the gospel. That's what it says. Preaches to him the gospel. They're in a desert place. And as they're going along, the Ethiopian says, Look, 
There's water in this desert place. There's water. We may not see water again for a while in this desert place. What prevents me from being baptized? So Philip takes him down into the water and he baptizes him. So what did Philip preach? He says the good news. What is the good news? Jesus rose, which means he demonstrated. He's not just the miracle worker that everybody was chit-chatting about. He rose from the dead and he communicated with people for 40 days and then they saw him ascend into heaven. And the angel said he's coming back the same way he left. There is no doubt that Jesus said, when you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up again in three days. He was talking about himself. And he came out of the grave, and nobody could deny it. And when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he said, this is it. You want eternal life? Is there anybody here that does not know that your life is finite? that you began at birth and you were going to end in death? Does anybody not know that? But these people are talking about an eternal life, a resurrected life. Is it true? Chit-chat, chit-chat. Wow, can this be true? Well, Jesus rose, and for that, there's no doubt. So how do I connect with the risen Jesus? How is it possible for me to get this eternal life? And Peter says, you must be born again. Repent and be baptized. Now, not by perishable things, by imperishable things, the implanted word, which is the seed of the kingdom. Now, to be a faithful follower of Jesus, one, you have to submit to him, you have to die to self. We've been making that argument from the beginning, Keyshawn, we were talking about you and your personal genealogy in this life when you die to yourself in that representation when you're buried with him in baptism. You die, you and your genealogy, just like Jesus ended the genealogy of the Hebrews, the Jews, ended their genealogy. Jesus is savior of the world, not just the Jews. Pontius Pilate put, you're the king of the Jews. The Jews didn't like that. But Jesus is king over all the nations, as Al, Alan read for us this morning in Psalm 82. Uh, he's lord of the nations. So, what does it mean to be faithful? How, how can we be faithful in a world as we sing uh, stepping in the light when everything is tempting us to be faithful is to trust him but you have to understand when he says repent repent means turn and learn and as you learn this word implanted in you is going to take effect it's a challenge Mary, right? We say, it's a challenge. Ah, I, I read it. I don't always understand it. Uh, but if I stick with it, it starts to have its effect on me. Uh, so faithfully stand. Trust him. Confess to him when you fall and you stumble. And you will. And you confess. He's faithful. He'll pick you up. He'll never leave or forsake you if you don't leave him. So that's our challenge, to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Faithfully stand means trust him. He gives you the power to stand. If you stand and you are executed, you are ensured an eternal reward. We're all, we don't get to choose our death, but we're all going to die this physical life. But not all are going to raise in glory. There's a judgment. How do we know that? Because the author of life told us. 
we can trust him. So then he says in verse 13, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. I, I like the names because it's personal. It's familiar, Alice. <laughs> we're, we're a body. And he says, she was at Babylon. What's Babylon? Why would he say Babylon? And likewise chosen. What's chosen? Who is she who's chosen at Babylon? She is the bride of Jesus. The church. The body. Jesus is the head. But we remember we said that Jesus' bride is undefiled. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this earth. It's a heavenly kingdom. He said, my bride cannot be defiled. Because when you come into the church, you are made clean by the blood of Christ. So you can't be defiled as we come together as the church, if we stand firm in that. Chosen. So in chapter 2, Peter said, you must put away all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Repent! You can't live this way anymore. Like newborn infants, 2 verse 2, Long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good and come to him as a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Chosen. Oh, I could run long on this. I won't. Claudia. <laughs> what does it mean? When Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then after he says, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on his name. And only those who are called or are chosen can come. Only those whom the Lord calls. How does the Lord call somebody? Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. But you're God's chosen and precious. In verse 5, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected have, has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do so. Chosen. Called. How do we make our calling sure? By hearing the word of God and obeying the word of God. When we obey, we now start to grow up and mature. And we mentioned standing firm is to be an example to our brothers and sisters. Um, Bradley said to edify one another when we come together, that we edify one another. We build each other up. Because we're chosen, because someone like Peter stands up, does not back down, does not deny the Savior, but suffers on a cross for him because that's what his master did. And he followed the example, then he gives others strength to stand up. Why? Because I will say, sorry, Gordon, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, I'll do anything to attain the resurrection. Anything. I'll suffer anything. Is there anything more important than eternal glory? You know, we're told that God will take care of us. Don't worry about the things 
God knows you need to eat. He knows you need clothes to wear. He knows you need a job. Don't be anxious about those things. God knows you need them. Trust him. We live in a time where we're told, I can't tell you. It was an emotional ride for me yesterday listening to some of these people who believe that we're all going to die. We're starving. The earth is drying up. Uh, you know, the litany of things. Uh, it's so great to be faithful and know that God will take care of you. He didn't put us here <laughs> to fight over resources. That's the world does that. She was at Babylon, the church, the bride of Christ, holy, undefiled, chosen, precious. Do you know that you're precious in the sight of God? You're precious. We mentioned this morning, there is no other way that God communicates his love and his gospel message outside the church. There is no other way. There, this is not uh, an administration delivered by angels. Well, like we're going to continue to make the contrast from the exodus from Israel leaving Egypt to the exodus uh, that now Jesus leads with his apostles. There is no other way. It's, it's not administered by angels, the Hebrew writer says. It's you, chosen, precious, holy, sanctified by the word so that you can tell the story, so that you can give life to those who are perishing. Chosen. And I like this. He says, sends greetings. And not me, Mark also. We're a body. And I like in, in 2 Peter verse 1, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. We're not. Jesus, can you uh, have my son sit on your right hand and on your left? Who, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? Peter says now. You have an equal standing with ours. What? Peter? You one of the super apostles? No. In the administration of the gospel message is the church. It was always destined, predestined, foreknown to be the church. The church is no afterthought. It's chosen and precious, holy and undefiled. Verse 14, greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Did Jesus come to earth to bring peace? And right, <laughs> we were looking at this in Luke, right, Elisa? In Luke, on uh, Wednesday in our study, we're looking at Luke, we were... Luke chapter 2, with this famous, we're coming into the season, and I love the Rankin and Bass and all the, the Christmas specials, but the Peanuts, Charlie Brown Christmas, and Linus. I, I gave the example of Linus. Lucy says, memorize these verses. And Linus says, I can't memorize this. This is too much pressure. Who can memorize these verses? And she says, you'll memorize these. He says, give me one good reason why I should memorize it. She said, I'll give you five. One, two, three, four, five. He goes, those are good reasons. <laughs> but he, he memorizes the verses and then he quotes them. Charlie Brown says, can anybody tell what the meaning of Christmas is? And Linus says, sure, Charlie Brown, I can. And he gets up and he recites it. And the key verse is, peace on earth, goodwill to men. This one we all, ooh, and the peanuts are singing in the background. <laughs> Ooh, peace on earth, goodwill to me. Sounds really good. Warms the heart. Peter says, 
peace to all of you who are in Christ. Jesus said, you, you think I've come to bring peace? No, I tell you, I, I bring a sword. Sorry, I, I, I jumped out of here again. I come to bring a sword. You want peace? You got to be in Christ. You want liberty? Freedom? Words we hold dear here in America, liberty and freedom. You want liberty and freedom? They're in Christ. Nowhere else. Liberty is not a, I've, I've said this before, liberty is not a man-made concept. Man did not invent freedom. The history of man is oppression and rebellion. Freedom is in Christ. Freedom conquered, Jesus conquered the world by setting it free, by dying to the world. What? Satan never saw that coming. What? Because slavery, we're told by the Hebrew writers, is lifelong slavery is the fear of death. But Jesus freed us from the fear of death and gave us eternal life. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So, faithfully stand we need to put our trust in him we need to be in the kingdom we need to live with purpose knowing that God not only chose you but sees you as precious the love of God cannot be quantified we use those big words during the week Gordon quantify that can't quantify the love of God can't even get our mind around it. Peace to those of you who are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, that's the gospel message. That's the message that the Ethiopian eunuch heard on a desert road. With all assurance, Peter and the apostles and all the prophets of God who went out and preach the good news before we have the scriptures complete for us uh, with one message. Eternal life exists because Jesus rose. His resurrection. We're going to celebrate his resurrection. We come here on the first day of the week. We need to be reminded because we live in finite terms. And that fear of death is devastating. We have to find a way, as Peter said, to be God's people, chosen people of hope, so that the world around you would say, give me a reason for the hope that's in you. The world so desperately needs hope today. These are extraordinary times that we're living in. I think wonderful times because the contrast is so great and people are getting desperate. I remember uh, in in Acts, we're going we're gonna to come across this story of Paul. When all hope was lost of their salvation, when they're about to be shipwrecked, all hope was lost. It, it makes me think of uh, the Jews standing before the Red Sea uh, and Pharaoh's armies behind them. All hope was lost. No way out. Now, God can do his work. When you realize you're powerless... God can do his work. If you're not in the kingdom, we're going to stand and sing this invitation song. You have the opportunity to join the kingdom and get in Christ.